Hello and welcome to another episode of Disruption Dialogues. I am Pranjal Sharma. I am an author based in New Delhi, India. And today I will be in discussion with Heather Albon, Senior Vice President and Head of Commercial Americas, Science and Laboratory Solutions at Millipur Sigma. Thanks, Heather, for taking time today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Heather, we're going to talk about the intersection of data and sustainability. I think both these themes are extremely important by themselves. You know, the data which is flowing from literally all corners uh, by terabytes and, you know, flying at us uh, nearly every second is a very, very uh, interesting challenge and a positive challenge to manage. But at the same time, sustainability. I think the question today we'd like you to talk about is how is data helping sustainability and what kind of data is coming out of sustainability efforts? Can you give us an overview of what is this intersection about? So I really see it about ways of working smarter. We're able to take and collect data on large, massive scales to see patterns and to identify ways of working more efficiently, making more processes more efficiently, or you know, in terms of research in the life sciences industry, using data-led methods to do things smarter and more efficiently and therefore more sustainably. You know, I, I think back when I took organic chemistry and, you know, we were using at that time just larger scale devices. Now, you know, they use smaller scale devices. In the future, we can imagine doing a lot of those experiments that we did in organic chemistry in silico. So it really is about but reducing the inputs and really um, using things in a much more sustainable way. I think, uh, Heather, that point of doing things in a sustainable way is critical, but I think when we look at data and sustainability, it's both about creating data sustainably as well as using data for sustainability. Would you put these together or would you explain this and help us understand this in two separate ways or do you think we have to combine them and look at them? Oh, I do think it's looking at data from both aspects. How do you generate it more sustainably? How do you do high efficiency methods that use high throughput methods that use less inputs to get more data out and then taking that data in turn and using it to inform your next set of um, experimentation and decision making. Can you give us some examples of work that has been done by Millipore in terms of how it has been used in a prudent in a sustainable and a mature fashion. Any examples which would help us understand? Sure. So we have a couple of software uh, programs that we have brought to the market that um, help not just ourselves, but there are things that will help our customers become more sustainable. One of them is our Cynthia product, which is a retrosynthesis software. It's computer-aided retrosynthetic design that reduces the time required to field and execute viable synthetic roots. So in a nutshell, it allows you to say what molecule you're trying to manufacture and it will do a retrosynthesis and give you a different routes of making that molecule, some of which are going to be much more environmentally friendly than others. And so you can do all of this in silico without investing anything in or creating any other waste. So it's a really powerful tool that, you know, things that used to have to be done with uh, solvents and generating waste to find the right routes of synthesis, you can now just do on the computer. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other software that we're really excited about is Addison, or Adison, I should say. It's a, to accelerate the hit binding and optimization process in drug discovery. By using the power of AI, you can predict the novel activities of the molecules with machine learning to predict PK profiles. So again, instead of creating a bunch of molecules in the lab and then taking them out using animal models to study the PK profiles, you're able to do all of this in silico. So it's not just more environmentally friendly and more sustainable, but from an ethical standpoint of using animals and animal models, you know, it helps on that front as well, just to create a much more friendly world, I should say. These are mostly within the life sciences sector and that's your focus area anyway. Mm -hmm. Heather, how is it evolving? Is it now more commercially applied or do you think some of these projects that you mentioned, are they still at pilot stage? Where is the evolution? 
So we, on both of those two softwares, those are commercially available and they are being used by the industry to aid their efforts and to do things more sustainably. You know, this is something that has been 20 years in the making. I myself started out as a computational chemist in graduate school. I'm trained as a computational chemist and we always thought of the day that one would just do in silico drug design. That reality hasn't hit yet, but we're definitely over the last 20 years since I graduated, I'm dating myself a little bit, but since I've graduated, we've made tremendous progress in reaching that vision. So these are things that are commercially available and are used throughout the industry at this time. How difficult is it to convince companies to use it? Is it making a business case for it? Do you see the benefit which is on sustainability parameters or are there also financial benefits of using such tools and such uh, softwares? Uh, I mean, there's huge financial benefits. So this is really um, a case where the, the software and the, the solutions really sell themselves. Um, something like a Cynthia, which goes beyond the life science industry, it's any manufacturing where you're doing a chemical synthesis by showcasing how you can, first of all, it's quicker. You can get to a synthetic pathway much more quickly than you can in the old days of trial and error, where you're you know creating your molecules, trying different routes of synthesis and generating waste. By doing these things in silico, you can do them much faster and, you know, you're not creating anything, uh, you know, you never leave your computer. So you're not creating the waste, you're not buying the chemicals, you're not creating the waste on the outputs. So it, it really makes tremendous business sense to do things in silico and, and, and to model things before trying them in real life. But does it require some changes in the processes when you try to put these new tools into a company? Do they have to invest in a new process, in a new system? Do they have to do things differently? They definitely have to do things differently, but that's an area where the industry has been moving, not just the life sciences industry, but the overall, what we would call the industrial sector, our applied markets have been moving in that direction. It does typically require people with a background in modeling, but as these tools become friendlier and easier to use, even that requirement is going away. Um, it doesn't require now, you know, a PhD to be modeling this stuff. These software packages are much more intuitive and, and easier to use than they had been in the past. If I look at the life sciences sector, Heather, there are several parts to it, as you know better than I do. Are there certain parts, perhaps, you know, from development to application to the various ways in which patients are benefiting? Are there certain parts which have adopted such technologies faster than others? I think we definitely have, um, we've seen a large push across from a sustainability perspective in life sciences in particular. We've seen a large push over the last, I would say, three to five years. It's always been on our focus, but now with kind of the ESG standards and some of the ratings, the rating agencies, the credit agencies getting into really looking at ESG more from a financial market standpoint and giving ratings on companies, and, you know, as activist investors have stepped up. I think it's really been pushed to the forefront. Through the COVID epidemic, uh, I think people were wondering, we were doing a lot of things maybe that weren't quite as sustainable. And was this the death of sustainability as we were in a rush you know, to find and address the pandemic? But as that crisis has subsided a bit, the focus and the moving sustainability to the forefront has once again become a high priority topic. So if I look at the work that Milipo Sigma does, I think it's, it's across in terms of offering solutions to support in development and manufacturing vaccine and, and discovery processes. How do you see, in your view, with your experience, how do you see the entire sector being impacted? What kind of positive disruptions do you anticipate in the coming months and years? Well, when we think about sustainability, we look at it from what used to be the three R's and, and now is the four R's. We, we take a holistic view of sustainability. So it is about reduce, reuse, recycle. And then there's also the rethink aspect, which is the fourth R that, that's relatively new. So from a reduction standpoint, for ourselves as a customer, for ourselves as a manufacturer, we've always tried to be a responsible partner in the communities where we're located and uh, the communities that we serve with our products. So from a regulatory standpoint, we work with regulators to ensure we adhere and contribute to the programs like REACH in Europe, which seek to reduce the use of harmful chemicals and substances. 
as risks become known, we look for alternative and safer options for both ourselves as a manufacturer, but then we turn around and we offer those safer alternatives to our customers as well as a chemical supplier. So our portfolio has actually over 1400 greener alternatives that life science manufacturers and others, med devices, um, even you know petrochemical industry are able to use in their processes. So uh, that's how we look at rethinking how we do manufacturing. From a reduced standpoint, we're looking at reducing our process-related emissions, improving our energy efficiency, and purchasing more electricity from renewable resources. This is also an area where you know you can use process remodeling to uh, monitor your emissions and to identify your areas that are the most risky and, and tackle those first. By 2030 at Merck, we intend to lower our direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions by 50% compared with 2020. And we'll do that using process related emissions uh, data and, and addressing those um, energy inefficiencies. By 2040, we hope to achieve climate neutral operations. So that's what we're aiming for at Merck. But as I said, it's not just enough to address our internal manufacturing, but we want to then take that and offer some of those solutions back to our clients for theirs. And that way we become a force multiplier, um, not just for the life science industries, but for all industry. I think that's a very positive and uplifting statement, uh, Heather, that you know, to be a force multiplier, to have an impact across and beyond the sector is quite fascinating. I want to end by asking you, as an expert, as a person with deep experience, what is it that's exciting you the most and what are you looking forward to in this space in the near future? The thing I think that um, really excites me the most is actually one of our uh, rethink of projects and that is really in the whole food movement. So, you know, we're going from 7 billion people on the planet to 10 billion by 2050 and obviously you know people need to eat and when you think about the need for protein and how inefficient you know the growing of food is um, especially when we refer to meat the work that we're doing in cultured meat and other 3d bioprinting applications i think is the most exciting at Merck and, and part of our Merck Ventures, we're investing in this space. One major hurdle to the clean meat movement is that the cost of materials for meat production. And the reason why this is of interest to us is the same technologies that make uh, biotherapeutics, the bioreactors, the cell culture media, this is the same technology and it's actually the same processes that will be needed to make uh, meat in the future. And so, but taking those processes and addressing the cost and the scale challenges is something that we're heavily involved in and heavily investing in. And so that's an area where I really literally think we can change the world. And thank you so much. I always find it fascinating and very, very encouraging when I hear a conversation where somebody, an individual and an institution are committed to changing and improving the world. I think that's, you know, in a world where things are not always going right, it's so heartening to hear such statements. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. And to all of you who were listening in, thanks for being there. I was in conversation with Heather Albon. She is the Senior Vice President, Head of Commercial America's Science and Laboratory Solutions at Millipo Sigma. We will be back with more such interesting conversations on Disruption Dialogues. Stay tuned. Thank you for listening to Hashtag Disruption Dialogues. If you are a strategy or market intelligence professional, we invite you to join our community on LinkedIn, Hashtag Disruption Dialogues.